I think a lot about sex. And I think a lot about blindness. I've spent much of the last 10 years following the work of sexual researchers and writing about Eros, a force that's so central to who we are as human beings, and thinking about the ways that we blind ourselves to possible truths about desire. And I think that our blindness has implications far beyond the realm of sex, because a lot of our blindness has to do with women, a lot of our blindness is particularly convenient and comforting for me, for men. And our blindness, of, because it affects the way we perceive the sexuality of women through the effect it has on that perception, it affects, I think, the way we view the very identities of women. A seemingly scientific theory has clouded our vision. The theory being that while men are programmed by evolution to spread their plentiful and cheap seed to be promiscuous, women, by contrast, are genetically scripted more to seek out one good man, to seek out emotional constancy and closeness, and thus, innately, to be better suited to monogamy. Now, how nice this is for society that half the population is genetically made to serve as a kind of social glue. And how nice this is for me, for men, because while my eyes may roam a little bit as I walk down the street, my partners, my longtime girlfriends, no, no, really, no, no wandering, no roaming, because nature has designed her sexuality to be more elevated than mine, less raw than mine, more human than mine, less animalistic than mine, and more bound up with intimacy. And hence, being bound up with intimacy, it's all bound up with me, 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 me. And I feel calmer just for having clarified that point. And now we can go back to the theory. The theory has a long history, um, but its most recent iteration uh, goes back to the early 1990s and was put forward by evolutionary psychologists. And it's really barely evidence-based. It rather relies on an abundance of circular reasoning that runs like this. Present-day observable patterns, for one example, that men more than women say they want casual sex, reveal to us what's been evolutionarily scripted in since the beginning of time, and that in turn proves that the present-day patterns are our evolutionary destiny, that this is us innately. And I think we, and I mean our culture, I mean women as well as men, have largely accepted this theory without examining the circularity of the proof. We tend to be drawn to neatly packaged evolutionary ideas about who we are as human beings. We're soothed by the thought, particularly when it comes to gender, I think that the way we are is the way we're meant to be. But science, led by female researchers, has begun to upend our assumptions. And I want to talk about a range of examples, but let's go first to the lab of Canadian researcher Meredith Chivers. And when I first met her, she was comparing what women say turns them on most to what their bodies say, using a little device called a plethysmograph, which measures vaginal blood flow. So, one among a range of examples. Take, on the one hand, a very handsome stranger, take on the other an equally handsome, hunky, and trusted close friend. Women say that they're more turned on by the scenario with the trusted close friend. Their bodies say something else entirely. <laughs> now, can a little device called a prophysmograph tell us everything we need to know about desire? No, definitely not. We all know desire is far too complicated for that. But what it can do is start to help us see past the constraints and the dictates of culture. Another idea, commonly held idea, that Chivers' experiments are addressing, the idea that really, when it comes down to it, women aren't all that visual when it comes to their sexuality. The obvious flip side of the theory that 
women are much more driven in their sexuality by emotion. Well, let me tell you, this is an idea that's held very, very dear by bald men. <laughs> but here's the problem. When Chiver shows pornography to self-identified heterosexual women, self-identified homosexual women, and she's done this over and over. This isn't a sensationalist uh, researcher. She replicates her experiments tirelessly. She does this over and over, shows them a wide array of pornography. Women respond physically, markedly, immediately to all of it. It's another interesting experiment. She's always redesigning the experiments as a way to kind of get at the sexual psyche from all kinds of angles. Um, show women and men, again, heterosexual, homosexual, their preferred category of pornography, and you'll get a very similar level of self-reported response. So again, men, women, pornography, basically equivalent level of self-reported response. Slight tangent, pair of German studies, 2,500 committed couples. The studies trace the trajectory of desire over time. Men and women tend to, on average, start around the same point of a high level of desire. There's no issue of an inherent lack of female libido. But while male desire declines gradually, on average, female desire within the relationship tends to plummet. I could go on, I could talk to you about how brain plasticity combined with what we tend to teach girls about lust might help to explain that divergence between the gradual decline and the nosedive, which, by the way, often tends to occur in an alarmingly few years. Um, but I want to save some time. I want to save some time for an evolutionary detour to our close primate ancestors, rhesus monkeys. This is the very species that we sent into orbit in spaceships as our astronaut doubles in the 1950s and early 1960s. It's fascinating because until quite recently, scientists were absolutely sure that in the rhesus kingdom, males were the aggressors in warfare and the initiators in sex. Females were passive. Females let out pheromones to enhance their attractivity, but they were not agents of desire. Kim Wallen, a primatologist at Emory University, has devoted his life to stripping away the blinders caused by what we expect and perhaps want to see. And as I stood on his observation towers next to him day after day, I got a lesson in the way that social conventions can profoundly affect perception, even the perception of scientists who are committed to objectivity. Because in fact, in the rhesus kingdom, it's the females who are the aggressors in quite brutal warfare. It's the females who are the rulers in Reese's politics, and it is the females who are very, very much the initiators in sex. Females stalk their sexual prey, the females objectify the males, the females blatantly leave their young unattended in the effort to get laid. The females have this way of tapping on the ground. It's this rhythmic kind of Morse code that they have that basically just boils down to serve me sexually now. Now, I want to caution against a temptation. Please don't misconstrue this female monkey behavior. Please don't elevate it in an attempt to domesticate it. This is not the female monkey saying, I want to have another child. No, evolution does not work this way. No female monkey is saying to herself, it's time to have another baby this season. This is about the search for pleasure, for immediate gratification. It's about desire. And one last thing before we leave the monkey kingdom. So every few years, Wallen, the primatologist, has to get rid of the males in the groups that he studies. He has to substitute in new males every few years because the females get too tired of having sex with the males who've been hanging around for a few years. All right, back to humans. Back to Meredith Chivers' lab. One more experiment. This one with uh, subjects 
who are self-declared heterosexual women. This one with still photographs, four types of disembodied genital photographs. Type one, dangling penis. Type two, uh, genital shot, female genital shot, kind of demure with legs together. Type three, less demure, female genital shot, legs apart. And four, an erect penis. Now, all four images create a marked physical response. But number four, the erect penis consistently makes the plethysmograph sore. Now, I don't think I have to say this, but I will. Does this mean that on average women want to have sex every time an erect penis is displayed unto them? Mm. Sadly, perhaps no, definitely does not mean this, but it does stand in such dramatic contrast to the prevailing evolutionary psychology paradigm wherein you know, male sex drive rages and the female version is much less raw, is restrained, is innately civilized. Chivers and her colleagues, as she puts it, are shaking the foundations of the way we think about female sexuality. So this raises the question why this has taken so long. And I think that an element of fear is involved. It doesn't seem like that should be so. A look at billboards and every other aspect of our culture will tell us that we're a sex-saturated society, we are seemingly unrestrained society, and yet, even in my extremely liberal Brooklyn neighborhood, my daughter can talk about an aspect of slut-shaming, while its counterpart, stud-shaming, is a comically unreal concept. I don't mean in this talk to dismiss biological difference, but we, men, boys, women, girls, are socialized differently, subtly, relentlessly, profoundly differently. Take one more detour with me, this time to Africa, where I, in another part of my writing life, I consider issues of nation building and economic development. And in a lot of the countries where I visit, clitoridectomy is practiced. So the glands of the clitoris the starter, as it's called in Sierra Leone, is cut completely or partly away in a puberty rite. And when I talk to people about why this is done, it's pretty clear to help keep women proper, to help keep women faithful. That is a long way from our reality here in the West, except that until recently we did some severe clitoral minimizing of our own. Somehow scientists until around the year 2000 managed to completely miss the fact that the clitoris has extensions. Right beneath the surface of the skin, rich in nerves, primed for pleasure, extensions that rival the penis for size. How did we miss this? We've been doing pretty accurate dissections of cadavers for centuries. And yet, scientifically speaking, we managed to cut the clitoris down to modest size. I do think there's a link between cultures, a thread of trepidation, of uneasiness. So what are we afraid of? One, obviously, there's the sexual threat to me, to men. And then, I think felt unconsciously, perhaps by all of us, there's the societal threat that if both genders, rather than just one, is driven powerfully, animalistically, even anarchically when it comes to sex, that we're all existing on the brink of chaos. But I think there's something more, because sex serves as a kind of metaphor through which we conceptualize and construct ourselves. And if men are innately more driven, more needful, more impelled when it comes to sex, 
Aren't men also more needful, more driven, more impelled when it comes to the workplace, when it comes to their vocations, when it comes to driving toward the lucrative and the monumental and the original? Aren't men innately then more driven to build great buildings and create great businesses and create great art? I wonder if we're all not a little bit afraid to think anything else. Because if we stripped away the blinders, we, so much more would be asked of all of us. And it's easier, more soothing, to tell ourselves that the way things are is the way they're meant to be. If we reimagined ourselves sexually, if we reimagined ourselves at the center of our psyches, we might have to reimagine our world. Thanks.